Good morning. Uh, so coming to the second session of the day, injection techniques in oft overlooked uh, and oft overlooked ACE uh, up your sleeve. I'm Dr. Pramod Bhur and uh, I, I'm, this is Dr. Ashok Ghodke. Uh, we welcome our chairperson, Dr. Uh, Kiran Bhavanani uh, today. So sir, please, could you start with the session because we have a long yeah, there's, there are a total of six speakers and uh, the first talk is by Dr. Anisha Valavi. Uh, she's going to speak on common conditions in the knee treated with injections. Good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Anisha. I'm going to talk on common conditions in knee treated with local injection. So as we all know globally there has been an exponential rise in the prevalence of knee osteoarthritis. And it has already affected 31% of Indian population with a prevalence of osteoarthritis being more than 70% in population of 60 plus age group. And also 34% of people, of people among them are already suffering from a chronic OA related joint pain. Similar things have been noticed in the western countries uh, where the burden forms about 80% of the total disease burden and 19% uh, of the American adults age 45 and older are also involved in this. So, and also the knee osteoarthritis uh, incidence has doubled, uh, prevalence has doubled since the mid 20th century. Uh, so much so that uh, in 2017-18, uh, uh, there, there were 54 million people in the US alone affected and they are, ex uh, uh, and it's been projected to be uh, 78 million of the uh, population being affected by 2040. Also, as the uh, age increases, the prevalence increases up to, as we have already said, uh, uh, talked about it, as in 70%, with women being maximally affected in the older age groups. The other inflammatory conditions around the knee are like the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies, crystal-induced arthropathies like gout, pseudo-gout, pre and pes anserine bursitis. And you also have to rule out when you're treating these conditions, you have to rule out conditions like fibromyalgia, disc prolapse, radiculopathy, spinal injury, cancer, post, and post-surgery conditions. So, so what are the treatment options available in these patients who come to the OPD with knee pain? So initially, as we all know, we treat them with oral, uh, 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 oral, uh, uh, oral medicines, as in paracetamol being the commonest, unless the patient is having any liver issues. Then comes the NSAIDs, but also they have low to moderate uh, risk of side effects as we uh, see here. And also to topical NSAIDs uh, uh, help. And how we tend not to, we have been uh, grown out of the use of opiates over the past so many decades. And other things are like physiotherapy load management. This topic is related uh, to knee injections of which we are going to uh, talk in the uh, next half. So the, we are looking to the short term pain benefits, long term pain, pain benefits and long term structural changes in these uh, uh, patients and the risk of getting, uh, risk of avoiding knee, uh, uh, avoiding the risk of knee replacement. So, so what are the, uh, why intra-articular injections and is it a definitive treatment in these population? So, Intraarticular injections, they, uh, uh, the goal of the intraarticular injection is to reduce pain and swelling, improve function and quality of life, limit disease progression. However, this is not a definitive treatment at all and is preferred as a last non-operative modality after exhausting and concluding that the other conservative treatment modalities are ineffective, like NSAIDs, physiotherapy, weight reduction. The substances used in intraarticular uh, intra injections are uh, as we all know, corticosteroids, intraarticular hyal hyaluronic acid injections, and the intraarticular platelet rich plasma, which has been recently in the WHO. So, the current literature indicates that intraarticular injections are safe and have positive effects for patient satisfaction, but there is no data that any of the intraarticular injection will cause osteophyte to regress or cartilage and meniscus to regenerate in patients with substantial and irreversible bone and cartilage damage. So talking about the corticosteroids, there are five FDA approved drugs that we uh, have been used over the decades. The me uh, methylprednisolone acetate, betamethasone acetate, and betamethasone sodium phosphate, dexamethasone, triamcinolol uh, acetonide, and triamcinolol uh, hexa hexacetonamide. 
So the mechanism of action of these corticosteroids, as we all know, is anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effect, which directly act on nuclear, nuclear steroid receptors and interrupt the inflammatory and immune cascade, reducing the vascular permeabil permeability, inhibiting the accumulation of inflammatory cells, phagocytes, phagocytosis, production of neutrophil superoxide, metalloprotease, and uh, hence all, and so on and prevent the synthesis of secretion of several inflammatory mediators like prostaglandin and leukotrienes. The effect is seen like in reduction, uh, reduction in the erythema, swelling, heat, and tenderness of the inflamed joints, and improved in the mobility of the joints. So, uh, the indications for corticosteroid use is to treat acute and chronic inflammatory conditions <laughs> which are not amenable to NSAIDs, physiotherapy, and re uh, weight reduction, and especially during the o uh, osteoarthritis flare where there is evidence of inflammation, chondrolysis, and joint effusion, uh, 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 and high-risk patients who, whose TK surgery have been deferred, patients who are having fear of surgery, and uh, however, the uh, use of intraarticular steroid lacks the evidence for efficacy in functional improvement like stiffness, walking distance, quality of life, at any point with, uh, of these injections. Contraindications for the intraarticular steroids are diabetes, overlying cellulitis, septic effusion, existing coagulopathies, and the common side effects known of these are the pain and swelling, skin discoloration at the site of injection, elevated blood sugar. So I have... Yeah, you carry on for one more minute. And allergic reaction to corticosteroids. So, uh, the other uh, 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 injectable that has been commonly used is, is uh, the visco supplementation, that is a hyaluronic acid injection. Uh, it's been pro uh, produced by the harvested rooster combs and bacterial fermentation. The commonly used uh, uh, HAI injections are sodium hyaluronate, hyalin GF20, and hyaline molecular, high molecular weight hyaluronol. These injections are scheduled uh, in various forms uh, from minimum of one injection to five injections depending on the uh, uh, mo molecular weight of the uh, product used. And it can be repeated after six months of the uh, initial uh, injection if the, pre if the patient is satisfied with the last injection. And uh, comparative clinical studies have uh, proven that the, the efficacy of high molecular weight uh, uh, hyaluronic acid with respect uh, is better uh, for disease modifying effects of the ONE. So uh, the mechanism is, uh, uh, it enhances the viscosity and elastic nature of the uh, synovial fluid, uh, adding to the viscous, uh, acting as a viscous lubricant and elastic shock absorber. Viscous lubricant in slow joint movement and elastic shock absorber in rapid joint movements and reduces stress and friction on the cartilage. It also for, uh, acts as a backbone for the proteoglycans of the extracellular matrix. And it restores, so the injections, uh, it restores the normal viscoelastic properties and restores uh, the lubricating and uh, shock absorbing effects. And yeah. yeah, I think you can tell us the bottom line. Uh, it's Veena, <laughs> sorry, it's Veena. Uh, the other type of injection that we all know is the platelet-rich uh, plasma. It's uh, made from the autologous blood by centrifugation to obtain a highly concentrated sample of platelets, which is four to five times higher than that of the normal blood. Normally, we have two and a half lakh uh, platelet count in the normal aspirate. After centrifugation, it uh, con gets concentrated to 10 to 40 lakh. So with such high concentration of the platelet, uh, it, is a, uh, it, it is a high source for uh, active molecules like uh, growth factors like interleuc uh, insulin, uh, insulin like growth factor, TGF, beta, PDGF, and active molecules like cytokines, chemokines, arachidonic acid, etc. And it has been proven to be a, a, a factor that, alter, uh, that uh, has a role in chondrogenesis, bone remodeling, proliferation, angiogenesis, and anti-inflammation and coagulation and cell differentiation. And it, has been, it, it is usually given in three sets of uh, PRP injections, either three to four weeks apart. It has shown good results in uh, young individuals uh, be, below f uh, 50 years of age if uh, the osteoarthritis is of grade one to three uh, below 50 years, 
it is proven that uh, platelet rich plasma is more effective compared to hyaluronic acid however if the patient is uh, uh, beyond uh, 50 years of age it is better that the patient receives uh, uh, intraarticular corticosteroid if it is a, an acute osteoarthritis flare and uh, so there have been studies numerous studies for uh, for the same suggesting that prp is more effective than uh, hyaluronic acid and steroid in uh, randomized control trials and uh, at 4 weeks Cortico two to four weeks corticosteroids have the maximum effect, showing that it has a uh, sh it has very good short term relief. Can you can you please summarize, pain. please? Yes, sir. Please. I'll just go. So the injection technique. So and <laughs> the topic was changed. Sorry. So uh, there are multiple injection techniques. That is a, that is the anterolateral approach, the lateral retropatellar approach, medial retropatellar approach, suprapatellar approach. And to summarize, choose the intraarticular uh, supplement wisely. Long-term benefits of injectable PRP are superior than hyaluronic acid in mild to moderate OA knee, in, especially in Kelgen uh, Lawrence grade uh, uh, 1 to 3. Injection PRP has shown better results in young individuals than injection uh, hyaluronic acid. Uh, use of steroids should be cautious. It should only be used when acute and severe flare-ups in osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthritis, or to bridge the gap till surgery. Uh, the uh, gap between the surgery and the steroid injection should be minimum of two to three months and uh, uh, or to uh, give it in high risk patients whose surgeries have been deferred or have fear of surgery and uh, it's reserved mostly for the uh, higher grade or acute flare ups so and maximize uh, maximum two to three uh, shots of steroids is the limit so that's it all right thank you so much thank you Yeah, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chintan Desai. He's going to speak on shoulder pain fixed with injections. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, my topic is about the techniques of shoulder injections and uh, shoulder pain fixed with shoulder injections. All right. So my indications for uh, shoulder injections are mainly for post-op pain management. We all know rotator cuff repairs uh, are very painful post-op or can be. So we want to minimize uh, the post-op pain of that patient. Now we all know that the book should not be judged by the cover, but most often it is. So no matter how good your surgery is, if the patient wakes up in pain, that's not ideal. So we want to fix that. The other outpatient department uh, treatments for shoulder pain which require injection in my opinion are bursitis, adhesive capsulitis, partial tears which are less than 50% thickness or low grade partial thickness tears, tendinitis or calcific tendinitis, impingement syndrome, spinoglenoid knot cyst and AC joint in, uh, pain. I generally tend to avoid giving injection in full thickness tears or high grade partial thickness tears and we will see why. Uh, so post-op pain relief, our anesthetists are brilliant at doing this. Uh, brachial block injections are quite effective and very effective in reducing the post-op immediate pain. The analgesic effect of just using 0.25 sensor cane as a brachial block, the effect would last for 6 to 8 hours. There are some additives that you can use, either with dexamethasone given IV or mixed in the cocktail, can in prolong that effect for, for, for a few more hours, so 8 to 12 hours. If you add clonidine, that's going to give you a pain relief for about 24 hours. So, uh, you know, all these additives can be added depending upon how much post-op pain you are anticipating and your patients wake up in comfort. Avoiding uh, these injections, uh, there are some contraindications or relative contraindications. If you are expecting a nerve injury or if you think there is going to be a brachial plexus stretch or if you are preoperatively anticipating nerve injuries, giving a brachial block is going to prevent you from seeing any post-operative movements. So analgesia is preferred, anesthesia tend to avoid. We have ropivacaine also available now, so we can use ropivacaine 0.75. That is only going to give us analgesia and not anesthesia. So if you use that, that's good. Several techniques of uh, access to the brachial plexus have been described, interscalene blocks being the most common, supraclavicular, vertical infraclavicular and axillary nerve ax or axillary approach to access the plexus. 
What I use and my anesthetists use is interscalene block. We can, as orthopedic surgeons, learn to do this ourselves as well. And this is quite uh, important, let's say, on field as well. Let's say if you know somebody had a bad injury and was in a lot of pain, we could give that on, on roadside as well. So interscalene blocks like this, uh, where you can mark out the sternocleidomastoid and uh, just lateral to the clavicular head, you'll see the interscalene groove and that's where you enter and inject. You could use a nerve stimulator to be more specific and ultrasound guided injections are now the norm in our ORs. So once we use this, we can access the brachial plexus quite well. We can see those sister nerves and uh, block around them and that's quite effective. Supraclavicular and axillary nerve blocks. Now, let's face it, sometimes the anesthetists take longer to find the nerves than our surgeries do. So in those patients, if your turnover time is affected, then what we recommend or what I do generally in those compromised situation is I prefer to use suprascapular nerve blocks or and axillary nerve blocks giving me good post-op pain relief. So when you mark out your portals or the uh, acromio, I mean the acromion and the inner border of the clavicle and acromion, and if you go from the nevasia portal, so that's the nevasia portal, you directly hit the suprascapular fossa and that's where the suprascapular nerve is. And you inject there with sensor K in 0.25, about 10 cc. And that's going to block your suprascapular nerve. That's very easy to do. You could do it your, yourself. And about three finger breaths down, posteriorly to the insertion of the deltoid, is where you inject uh, in that space and that's going to give you a good axillary nerve block. So uh, these patients will wake up with good comfort. And uh, these are very simple treatments or procedures you could uh, use in your practice to help your patients wake up in pain-free. Outpatient procedures, uh, I prefer to do USG guided injections for bursitis and impingement. I use 2% lignocaine and 40 milligrams trimcinolone. And uh, that allows me a good access. I know there's a talk about US, the benefits of USG and I'm sure you know, this uh, will, will show the effects. Now, uh, when we, we are able to locate very well the bursa in this patient, we can see the bursa blowing up when you inject over there. That's going to create a good space in the subacromial space and you see the impingement sort of disappearing. Now, there are several studies that say that, you know, uh, unguided blocks versus, you know, guided injections or USG guided injection, not much post-op difference, but I think that's just because uh, of the effect of the medication. I mean, the steroid is going to be, if, be effective only in that much period of time. Uh, intra-articular injection techniques, uh, we can use in adhesive capsulitis especially, you can use this because the inflammation is intra-articular in the capsule. You can access it through the anterior side, uh, just lateral to the coracoid process, or just from the as like an a posterior uh, uh, from a posterior portal where we insert a scope. That's exactly where you can put your needle in and go and access the capsule. You inject there with a steroid, and those patients uh, are quite good. Now, uh, there are these are some randomized control studies I have just showed because there is an increased use of platelet-rich plasma and uh, modalities like this to treat shoulder pain. In my opinion, I don't use them because I don't see that much benefit, especially cost benefit. And uh, uh, these randomized control studies say the same, that you know, short term or long term results of steroids versus PRPs is nearly the same. So I stick to the basics and continue to give steroids in these patients. Prolotherapy is something which is also described is a high concentrated glucose solution which is induced or introduced uh, to create some scarring. And uh, that as well in a randomized control study is showing that there are similar results to steroids. So I still uh, follow the same. Giving steroid injections in partial thickness stairs, beware that 17, in this study, 17% patients have progressed onto full thickness stairs beyond giving a steroid. So is that going to cause weakness of a rotator cuff muscle? Still questionable, but we have some evidence that some patients do progress to full thickness stairs. This was a very interesting study. Do corticosteroid injection compromise rotator cuff tendon healing after arthroscopic repair? This is an everyday thing for us, for me at least. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting finding that they found that preoperative corticosteroid injections given actually do not cause any increased rate of re-tears. However, post-operative, if you've given a steroid injection after a rotator cuff repair, let's say your patient is stiff or not improving, those patients actually had a higher re-tear rate. Now, uh, there is a discussion in this study as well saying that maybe those patients were already doing poorly, which is why they did not improve, which is why steroid was given. Was that really a risk factor? 
don't know, but uh, that is still some anecdotal evidence to say. Anyway, thank you. I hope I did justice to the topic. Thank you for thank your you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, just a small request, if we can stick to the time, I think we are exceeding our time. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Amit Supe. He's going to speak on ace up your sleeve to get, the, to get rid of elbow pain with injections. Ace up your sleeves, uh, Mohammed Faisal. Uh, good morning all. Uh, I will be presenting Ace Up Your Sleeves to get rid of elbow pain with injections. So the indications for injections around elbow are pain because of arthritis in lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, olecranon bursitis or bicep, distal biceps tendinopathy. So in arthritis of elbow, we can always see there is reduction in the joint space. In elbow anatomy, the elbow joint formed by the radiocapitular as well as ulnohumeral joint and the stability provided by the soft tissues, tendon and ligaments. Intraarticular elbow injections are given in rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, crystal arthropathy. The injections should be only considered with the appropriate therapeutic interventions for rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis or crystal arthropathy. These are the equipments and the pharmaceuticals for the injection of the elbow joints for elbow joint aspiration, we usually need 18 gauge needle and for the olecranon bursitis aspiration also, we will require a wide bore needle of 18 or 22 gauge while for the elbow joint injection or in epicondylitis or bursitis, we require 25 gauge needle along with the anesthetic agents of 3 to 5 ml of 1% lidocaine or bupivacaine along with the corticosteroids of 1 to 2 ml of bethamethasone or 1 to 2 ml of methylprednisolone. So the technique for elbow joint aspiration, we need to pass the needle through the triangle formed by the lateral epicondyle, radial head and the olecranon. The needle should be directed towards the medial epicondyle. Patient should be in the supine position with elbow flex to 45 degrees and forearm in the neutral position resting on the thigh of the patient. The follow-up care should be in the patient should keep in the supine position for one to two minutes after injection, check for the passive ROM to determine the pain relief. Patient should be monitored for at least 30 minutes for any adverse reactions. Patient should avoid any strenuous exercise for 48 hours following injection. If there are steroid flares, they should be treated with the ice and NSAIDs and follow-up should be done within three weeks. For medial and lateral epicondylitis, the lateral epicondyle, we know it is the origin of the extensor supinator muscle group, while the medial epicondyle is the origin of the flexor pronator muscle group. The epicondylitis, as it suggests the name, inflammation, but it is not an inflammation, it is a chronic degenerative process of tendons at the respective epicondyles. Clinically, it can occur because of the repetitive activities such as golf, which can cause medial epicondylitis, playing more tennis can cause lateral epicondylitis, throwing sports and hammering. Patient will have tenderness, pain and weakened hand grip. And weakness is exacerbated by resisted wrist extension and supination for lateral epicondylitis, which is mill sign, while resisted wrist flexion and pronation for medial epicondylitis. So indications of injection are chronic pain and functional disability and acute severe pain with the functional impairment. Therapeutic injections for epicondylitis should be performed only after trial of other therapeutic modalities such as use of NSAIDs and avoiding aggravating activities. For lateral epicondylitis, the affected arm should be placed at the side with wrist pronated and elbow flexed to 45 degrees. The needle should be inserted to the level of bone at 90 degree angle and to pull back 1 to 2 mm. The point of maximum tenderness should be addressed. For medial epicondylitis, the arm should be abducted, elbow extended and the hand should be supinated as the injection is administered. The elbow should always be extended for medial epicondylitis because it may cause the iatrogenic ulnar palsy. For preparation and techniques, steroid and local injections can be given. We can also use the papering techniques in which we inject, then withdraw, then again redirect the needle 
without pulling it out of the skin then again inject again again withdraw again rehydrate uh, rehydrate till the grating sensation in the tendon is lost dynadeline and autologous blood transfusion can be given platelet rich plasma or botulinum toxin can be given botulinum toxin causes the digit paralysis this is a study where the hyaluronic acid injections for chronic tennis elbow were given in 18 patients where 2 cc of hyaluronic acid was given at the site of the maximum tenderness where three injections were given two weeks apart it, in this study the authors got improvement in quick dash was and patient related patient rate tennis elbow evaluation scores in three months and improved pain scores in the hand grip in this study the platelet rich plasma was given for the medial epicondylitis in 15 patients and the authors got good results in uh, full ROM and Mayo performance scores. This is a study where the local injections were given in 120 patients. In 60 patients, 1 ml of lidocaine was given, while in the 60 patients, 1 ml of lidocaine along with non uh, was given using the papering technique. The steroids were having the short term effect and uh, excellent results were obtained in the both groups using the Verhars criteria. In follow-up, patients' extensors and flexors should be stressed. Then the next entity is the olecranon bursitis. Olecranon bursa is extra-articular and superficial to the olecranon process. And olecranon bursitis commonly occurs after repetitive trauma to the elbow, rheumatoid arthritis, and crystalloid arthritis. Clinically, there will be swollen red fluid sac, fluid-filled sac. It is relatively painless. In acute conditions, we need to only aspirate while in the chronic condition, corticosteroid injection can be given. Staphylococcus aureus infection is commonly seen, and in such conditions, we should avoid the steroids. In supine position and with elbow flex, we have to palpate the olecranon sac, and the needle should be directly inserted. Pressure dressing should be given once the aspiration and injection is done. Then in distal biceps tendinopathy, it has a spectrum which include bicipitoradial bursitis, chronic tendon degeneration, distal biceps partial tear, Excuse and distal biceps uh, complete tear. It has, a patient may have pain and tenderness and reduced flexion and supination strength. In this study, using the sonography in 12 patients, the injections of steroid were given, 2 m milligram of ropivacaine, 40 milligram of triansimilon, and 1 ml of normal saline, and improved VAS scores at the 6 months. The complications of the in injections can be skin and soft tissue atrophy, lipodystrophy, loss of hairs, depigmentation or hyperpigmentation, steroid flare-up reaction, septic arthritis, and systemic effects which are very rare like Cushing syndrome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, injections in the hand, Dr. Ashok Godgi. Thank you. So, some injection techniques. Uh, today we will present common conditions like ganglion, trigger finger, decurvans, carpal tunnel syndrome, TFCC, dipitrans, and acute cervical disc. So, we straight away go with some video presentation. This is a ganglion case, 35 female, uh, swelling since 3 months. So, this is the way we first palpate and see if it is fixed. and. At the point of entry, we give local anesthesia first and then this is the solution, uh, local anesthetic with kinacot with some normal saline. So the idea is we don't aspirate the, uh, the ganglion fluid, we, we should go inside and push in so that the ganglion bursts. So this is, this is the procedure, so here the, the injection, it is injected into the ganglion and we give some gentle pressure and spread that, that uh, and this is the way the ganglion is treated. So many times, uh, uh, this is another case where the ganglion is in the base of the ring finger and again almost the same technique, uh, the injection, local anesthetic with steroid, it is injected, injected and uh, so the recurrence rate we have seen is very less. 
This is another case where trigger finger, uh, she is a 58 year old female, uh, complains since two months and so this is sort of severe type of trigger finger where we have to uh, use other hand to reduce it and again we mark the uh, a, we mark the A1 pulley and the point of entry we, we use local anesthetic so that the wide bore needle which we use for steroid injection uh, it is sort of painless. Decurvance, 28 female, postpartum, 6 months, usually they say that this post, uh, postpartum decurvance, it resolves of its own, but here she was having pain. This is Finkelstein's test positive and we can see this. And again, we do marking. So at the tip of radial styloid, 1 centimeter proximal is the extensor tendon, uh, uh, retinaculum. So there we inject local anesthetic and okay so tfcc tfcc pain this is the foveal sign positive on the left side and we do ballotment ballotment is also positive so again we do the marking marking is done and we see the foveal foveal the point of entry over there some local steroid is is given and further we give this steroid along with uh, local anesthetic. So uh, very very common presentations in OPD, TFCC injuries. This is a case of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, left more than right in a 40 years old female. So some confirmation with the provocative tests. So this is reverse phalanx test and we mark the point of entry so we flex the ring finger wherever it touches that is the point of entry and this this point to this point is the transverse carpal ligament and it is always mandatory whenever we are using local anesthetic to do a skin test so we do this a subcutaneous local anesthetic and once we give that we do a marking and write timing over there so this is very important because even though uh, if we get any reaction adverse reaction so this is at the point of entry we give some local anesthetic and this injection we do prefer using ultrasound uh, uh, guidance. So we have a lecture, next lecture is with that. So this is for the carpal tunnel syndrome. Dupitrans, this is 50 years old male. Uh, left side it is moderate, right severe. So severe, right side we operated and left side we did, did this needle fascia tectomy. So this way we go inside and do the fascia tectomy. So this is for the Dupuytren's contracture. This is a very special situation like acute cervical disc with severe radicular pain and uh, patient came with hand above the, above the head. It was so painful. So this is the point where we give this, this combination of injection like uh, uh, the local anesthetic with kinacot with clonidin and we can see some dramatic results, the pain patient has very satisfactory results with this. So this is an acute cervical disc where we inject in this first web space at the base of second metacarpal. So dramatic relief after that for acute cervical disc with severe radiculopathy. So these are techniques for common conditions with easy solutions, with a fast learning curve and a great relief for patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. <coughs> Our next speaker is uh, USG, uh, Dr. Ankit Shah, who is going to speak on USG. Is it a useful guide for giving injections?
All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, uh, th thank you so much for the uh, invitation. So, I'll be talking on ultrasound guided uh, musculoskeletal uh, injections. So, the learning objectives are to identify or learn what are the needs for ultrasound guidance uh, for doing your injection procedures. Uh, see how we can uh, visualize a needle better on ultrasound and what are the common applications. So why bother with ultrasound guidance, all right? So we've been already doing it so well for so many years using landmark guided techniques, so why ultrasound? For the simple reason is that you know ultrasound guided injections have better accuracy compared to landmark guided injections. And it's not just me saying that, and there's, a, there's tons of literature supporting uh, this whatever I say. It's just that, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, if you're using more expensive, uh, you know, injectates like PRP or stem cells, you want to make sure that you get it at the right place so that the patient has the maximum benefit for that. So uh, ultrasound becomes really important when, you know, the anatomical landmarks are obscured, especially if the patient is obese in the post-operative settings, if there are any anatomical variations. So uh, ultrasound can really help you identify, uh, you know, the site that which you want to inject and it's going to make your life much more easier. So uh, this is how you visualize a needle. This is the most common way. The needle is parallel to the probe. That's how you go and you'll be able to see the entire length of the needle and the in-plane technique. That's what we call. And this is a slightly less popular technique which is known as an out-of-plane technique where the needle is 90 degrees to the ultrasound probe and the, typically the probe cuts the needle. So you'll be seeing the needle as a dot. So this is, we use it less commonly, maybe in more superficial structures, like you know, if you want to inject the ankle or maybe you want to inject the scapholunate ligament, that's where this can be useful, but most of the time we'd be using this in-plane technique. And so let's say we are trying to inject for uh, a trigger finger. This is what an in-plane technique would look like. You look at the probe and that's the uh, position of the needle, whereas an out-plane technique, you keep the probe in a horizontal fashion and you insert the, uh, the needle which is almost 90 degrees to the probe position. So in, in pl plain technique you will be seeing the needle come in, uh, in along the entire length and you'll be seeing the tip all the while. Whereas in out plane technique what happens is while you're seeing the needle you have to be very careful because by the time you see the, the dot over here uh, the needle tip must have already progressed uh, distally. So this you got to be really careful and this is uh, the technique that we use most commonly. Uh, try and keep the needle as parallel to the probe as possible because the more parallel the needle to the probe, the more uh, well visualized the needle will be because if it goes more than 45 degrees, the visualization of the needle becomes a little bit more difficult. So plan your procedures accordingly. So the general principles are that you know, whenever we are injecting around the tendons and the nerves, we see the tendons and the nerves in the cross section. That means they are seen as rounded structures. All right. So this is the uh, 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 you know, injection for decurvans tenosynovitis. You see the compartment one tendons as rounded structures, and this is the injectate. That's the needle. And uh, this is a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome where we see the median nerve as a rounded structure and the needle is either uh, goes uh, from medial to lateral or from lateral to medial so that you know you can inject around the nerve superior as well as inferior to the nerve. As far as joints is concerned, uh, there's no uh, one particular technique. So this is one patient with frozen shoulder where we see that the needle goes, that's the glenohumeral joint, that's the long axis of the needle. This is once we, uh, we enter the joint, you see the injectate flowing right over here. All right, so joint, whichever is the best position uh, of the visualized joint cavity, that's what we follow. And uh, we typically go from lateral to medial from the posterior approach. So there are three common uh, clinical scenarios where we can use ultrasound guided uh, injections. Uh, one is purely therapeutic. Uh, uh, you know, scenario where you want to do some kind of a therapy for the patient. So this is one 37-year-old female with decurvian stenosynovitis. That's the radial styloid and that's the thickened extensor retinaculum and that's the compartment 1 tendon. Now over here, what we see is this compartment 1, you have isolated involvement of the EPB, so you have an accessory septum over here. So as my needle goes from 
the radial uh, 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 from dorsal to volar, what I do is I in inject over here around the APB. But if I want to inject around the APL as well, what I need to do is I will have to go through the septum over here and go through that. So uh, this was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. We go from uh, medial to lateral and that's what we see, the, uh, the injectate over here in the distal radial nerve joint. And uh, uh, this was a patient with plantar fasciitis. That's the position of the probe. And this is how I would go from medial to lateral. That's the position of the needle. I would not want to inject over the, uh, inside the plantar fascia, but right on the surface. So this was a patient with uh, greater trochanteric pain syndrome. You would want to inject in the greater trochanteric bursa, especially it becomes useful when a patient has large amounts of body fat. Uh, this was a patient with Morton's neuroma over here. So you would want to inject in the intermetatarsal bursa. So this is the needle and this is the amount of injectate which is flowing right in over here within the bursa and distending it. So this is a second scenario where you have therapeutic and diagnostic uh, we are yes. running out of time. We have one more speaker. Yes. All right. I'll just. So fine. I'll just skip this. Uh, so this was a 74-year-old with ankle pain, operated seven years ago. You want to make sure what is the cause of the pain. So that's when in the post-operative setting, you can inject within the joint right over here. So uh, I'm just going to skip some of these. And ultrasound-guided injections can be uh, done before or after a therapeutic procedure. For instance, a patient with, uh, uh, with a trimalleolar fracture, uh, you know, they could not get the appropriate reduction because of pain. You just inject within the joint when all your anatomical landmarks are distorted. And uh, this was the presentation. This was close reduction with blind local anesthesia. They couldn't get it. And this is what we got with ultrasound-guided local anesthesia. And uh, this is just the last case under calcific tendinosis. Uh, so after we've aspirated the calcium, what we do is this is the aspirate. And then what we do is under ultrasound guided inject within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So uh, the take home message is uh, ultrasound guided injections are remarkably accurate. They're safer and they allow be better decision making. So if you are in a spot while uh, doing some kind of a procedure to not shy away from using ultrasound for your procedure. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Pramod Bhor. And uh, probably we are running out of time, so we'll just finish this off in about four minutes. Yeah, try to finish in three. <laughs> so coming down to the paradigm shift of uh, management in management of osteoarthritis, with triamcinolone hexat uh, acetamide. Um, so basically, how do we manage osteoarthritis? There is a 2021 article from American Academy of Osteo uh, AOS um, saying that we should manage with analgesics first and if uh, possible, give intraarticular steroids which can be used for uh, better and uh, longer uh, this thing for three around three months. So what is the need for intra-articular glucocorticoids? So we have been using glucocorticoids, methylprednisolone, triamcinolone, acetamide. So the dura duration of action of methylprednisolone is seven days intermediate and 14 days, which is a long acting, that is triamcinolone, acetamide. The mean residence time of uh, triamcinolone, acetamide, that is TA, is 3.1 days. Due to the short mean residual time, the duration of action is 7 to 14 days, uh, and that is why repeated actions are uh, repeated injections are needed. That means that is approximately for every three months. So repeated injections causes septic arthritis, post injection increases the inflammation, joint damage, and etc. So that is the need for change of injections. So need for intra-articular glucocorticoids. So rapid pain relief, whenever there is an acute uh, case, definitely you require uh, to go ahead and uh, give an intra-articular steroid. Increased uh, intra-articular steroid with increased mean residence time is needed. And long-term response should be needed. So whenever you require uh, to use an intra-articular steroid, it should, should see that it is giving a long-term effect. So triamcinolone hex hexacetonide, basically it is a long-acting uh, uh, injection. It, the, uh, it is a long uh, for about large joints around 1 ml that is 10 to 20 mg of uh, injection is needed medium sized joints around 10 mg smaller joints around uh, 2 to 6 milligram that is 0.1 to 3.3 ml 
indications uh, is osteoarthritis sometimes in post traumatic rheumatoid juvenile or idiopathic synovitis tendonitis etc so basically uh, the duration the onset of action is 24 hours uh, within 24 hours it is an anti, is an anti inflammatory if activity no mineral corticoid infection uh, active effect so lesser side effects so the difference uh, between the other uh, this thing is that systemic absorption is around 35 to 40 percent with a triamcinolone on hexacetonide, whereas in 58 to 70, uh, 67 percent with uh, TA and uh, the other with 70, 78 percent or more. So lesser side effects, lesser systemic exposure, longer duration of action. This is basically because of the lower solubility rate, uh, solubility of the triamcinolone uh, hexacetonide. So synthetic glucocorticoid is with pronoun pronounced anti-inflammatory activity, almost insoluble in water, and therefore dissolution and uh, dispersion in the tissue uh, at the injection site is generally slow, takes few weeks to uh, several months. Anti-inflammatory potency is appro uh, approximately five times that of hydrocortisone. Triamcinolone has practically no mineral uh, min mineralocorticoid effect, therefore no sodium retention, relatively safe in cardiovascular and uh, renal patients. So coming down to clinical relevance, it has a, it, uh, it has a greater uh, reduction in the VAS compared to placebo. Uh, there are many studies done on that. And secondly, coming down, uh, the TA, uh, THA has uh, provided short-term relief in pain of, uh, in relief of OA. Uh, increased benefit is associated with both clinical evidence of joint effusion as well as uh, successful aspiration of synovial fluid. So basically, uh, recommendation is to aspirate the synovial fluid pre-op uh, be before giving the injection. So there have been studies, clinical evidence, uh, evidence supporting the rapid pain reduction of triamcinolone aspirate. So it suppresses uh, um, the uh, HPA axis as compared to the uh, methyl prednisolone, prednisolone therefore offering more safety. Adrenal suppression and everything is less as compared to, so that is why it is more less uh, systemically, uh, has less systemic side effects. The rate of absorption and duration of action is, action is more, so that is why it is faster in, uh, and longer duration. So there have been many clinical studies done, clinical evidence supporting long-term sustainable uh, response of triamcinolone tram over 24 weeks. So uh, there have been studies done uh, along with methyl prednisolone. There are the study groups uh, have been uh, patients with knee osteoarthritis with ACR criteria with failure of symptoms. Uh, to control with NSAIDs and analgesics, VAS score of more than 40 mm, age more than 40, uh, exclusions is uh, rheumatic uh, and or inflammatory conditions, symptomatic uh, disease with lower limb, etc. So it has showed improvement in pain and function uh, can be sustained up to 24 weeks. Similarly, uh, for bilateral ONE, similar uh, exclusion and inclusion criteria have been used. Efficacy. Uh, peaks at two weeks after injection and effects continue and long term until the 24th week. Uh, the dosing of uh, knee synovitis in chronic polyarthritis, uh, this study was done. Uh, the proportion of relapse of uh, after six months was equal to 20 mg or 40 mg and no significant difference was found in patients with rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. So, summary. So triamcinolone hexacetamide is comparable in efficacy to the current available intracorticular corticosteroid. It scores above others, uh, absorbs slower current, uh, than currently available intracorticular corticosteroid, thus creating lower systemic corticosteroid levels, uh, suppresses the HPA axis as compared to methylprednisolone and prednisolone, thus by, thereby offering safety, more safety, better intraarticular duration of action as compared to methylprednisolone and triamcinolone acetamide. THA is less soluble than methylprednisolone and, uh, and triamcinolone acetamide within the synovial fluid, thus increasing the mean duration of action within the synovial joint. So basically, it's a long-acting uh, uh, corticosteroid that has been used. Thank you.